Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, you know, first of all, I just want to, you know, thank God for allowing me to be here, you know, my family, uh, you know, to take another breath. And, you know, first of all, you know, thank him for that. And yes, on July 3rd of 2022, you know, uh, my family and I we were celebrating our freedom uh, when this neighbor that we had just met outside when we were lighting fireworks made small talk, but we went in the house. Uh, but, you know, he made his way inside the house and just, you know, started shooting at all of us. You know, it was an unfortunate, unfortunate event, but, you know, story is he, <clears throat> one of my first buddies, uh, unexpectedly, he just gets shot in the, in the throat twice. So this guy just out of nowhere, just like his, this switch just like flipped and he just pulled out his, you know, nine millimeter pistol and just start shooting. You know, first shot was my buddy Carl, shot him twice. By the time I, you know, realized something was going on, you know, I turned my head to see what was going on. I caught a glimpse, but you know, he caught me right here in the side of the head. Uh, bullet went straight through, you know, fracturing my jaw and everything and, you know, took out my left eye and fortunately didn't hit any, you know, my brain or anything, but of course, you know, started bleeding out immediately. And that's, you know, when I hit the ground, you know, when all hope was lost and everything, you know, my wife runs to me, she tries to pick me up and, you know, she's just telling me, get up, get up, let's go. And that's when she, you know, she grabs my face and turns my head and she just sees like a fountain of blood, you know, just, just falling down my face. And, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for the next thing that she does. You know, she had a choice to run out the door, try to save herself, but she doesn't. She, you know, thinks of my daughters, which uh, at the time, you know, I had two daughters and she was seven months pregnant at the time. So I had an unborn child on the way. <clears throat> she runs to the bedroom finds my two daughters uh, with three other children that were in there. Puts them in the closet, throws clothes on top of them and just, you know, tells them, you know, be quiet. Don't make a sound. And just, you know, closes that closet door, closes the, you know, the front, you know, the bedroom door. And with all her strength, she just moves the dresser, try to barricade that door. Uh, patiently waiting you know, for that gunman to come in and, you know, take her out as well and hoping he doesn't find the kids. So as this is happening, you know, I'm on the floor bleeding out. I had a buddy that already, you know, got shot twice and he's, you know, just dead. They're on the ground. Uh, he makes his way towards the living room where everybody's running out. He just, you see a crowd of probably like 10 plus people trying to, you know, funnel their way through that front door. And so, he just starts shooting at everybody. He just, you know, whoever he can catch, he probably shot about five people, four or five people. Unfortunately, uh, another friend, you know, he got caught in the leg and, you know, he hits the ground, he couldn't make it out. So he's literally right by the front door, just there. And so he starts trying to crawl out the house. This gunman literally just walks up in front of him and just, you know, points his gun at the top of the head. And, you know, he just starts pleading like, you know, why are you doing this? With no care in the world, he just pulls the trigger and just executes him right there. That's when the gunman, you know, just decides, let me go back in the house or, you know, make my way. Let me go check out the bedrooms. Closest bedroom was, of course, the master bedroom. And that's when he makes his way in the master bedroom. You had three women with two little boys, you know, hiding in the master closet. Uh, he shoots down the door because it was locked. And one of my friends, she was actually like trying to hold the door closed to make sure while the other girls and the boys were hiding in the closet. And she catches probably about six bullets, like three or four in the arm, thankfully, and just, you know, a couple in the leg. Nothing vital, you know, didn't hit nothing major, but he breaks down that door. And I mean, she does the bravest thing ever. She tries to wrestle him, grabs his hand, just tries to avoid, you know, any further, you know, gunshots or anything. So she grabs his hand and she just starts yelling and 
she starts yelling my name she had mentioned. You know, when I got out of the hospital, she's like, hey, I was yelling your name because I knew, she knew I carried a, a concealed firearm. So she was yelling my name and she was able to get the, uh, the shooter to empty out his magazine, just shooting, you know, randomly, not shooting her again. And so when he runs out of ammunition, <clears throat> you know, it that was, you know, in that mag, he just drops his gun, gets behind her and just tries to choke her out, just tries to finish her off, you know, arm around her neck. He wraps his legs around her and just, you know, falls to the ground and tries to finish her off. <clears throat> uh, one of the girls in the bedroom, you know, decides to do something about it as well. So another brave girl, she finds a rifle that she couldn't load. So, but she just takes it out and she starts trying to strike them. They both try to fight them off. But, you know, you got these two little, you know, they're short, you know, small girls trying to fight this, you know, tall, bigger guy. It just doesn't look like it's going well, but that's at that point is like, like something happened, you know, when all hope was lost. You know, I'm on the ground, you know, bleeding now, just passed out. You know, that's literally when my eyes open. You know, my eyes opened and confused, of course. But vision wasn't really there. You know, he had just taken out my left eye and, you know, have this fountain of blood still just crawling down my face. And I just see like blur shapes. I can kind of see. And that's like when I knew, like, I knew what I had to do. You know, I had that choice to either try to run out or follow those screams. So I had a choice and, you know, it was a no brainer at that point. You know, I, I got to go towards, towards those screams. But, you know, I, I feel like autopilot kicked in and I wasn't in control. Like just God had me there, you know, like that was it. I was his tool. And so, no brainer, I got up and just first instinct, pulled out my firearm, just went towards that bedroom. And as soon as I saw him, didn't really know like if it was him. Like I said, I just see shapes, but something told me like right there. As Soon as I saw that, I just put four rounds. Four rounds, you know, center mass and all four rounds actually caught him. Two hit his heart and you know, he died instantly right there and that just stopped. You know, that stopped that. And you know, the aftermath, you know, everything, the girls are still yelling, you know, they ran out the bedroom and <clears throat> one of my buddies had came back into the house during the aftermath and he goes, knocks on the door where my wife is and starts telling her like, hey, uh, it's over. You know, the shooter's dead, Roll killed him. And my wife's just like, like, what the heck? What do you mean Roll killed him? Roll's dead. I saw him die. And he's like, no, Roll's not dead. You know, Roll killed him. And she's like, you're lying. You know, no. Like, she's just, you know, so much emotion and everything going on. She's like, no, you're lying. She finally just recognized that voice and, okay, something told her. Okay, so she moved the dresser, opened the door. She saw friendly face. And that's when she literally like just walks out the door and you know, you have the hallway and she looks right, looks left and just sees me standing there. Just sees me literally just leaning on the wall and she just, she had mentioned like, I look like a zombie, like in those zombie movies, like that's what I look like just leaning on the wall and just like that moment for her was just this relief like, my daughters come out the closet and they didn't know what's going on. They knew there was an active shooter. They asked for me, but of course my wife wasn't going to tell them like, you know, he's dead. You know, where's daddy? I, I don't know, but we need to hide. I think he was outside. I don't know, but you know, but then seeing me and, you know, just my family ran to me, not a care in the world if I got blood on them and anything like that. Just, you know, it was just this amazing you know, feeling just being able to hug my family again, you know, and then being able to hug me. Well, the guy that, you know, had told my wife that the, the shooter's down, you know, he takes the girls outside to the front and, you know, I'm leaning on my wife. She's helping me. We're walking. And 
soon as I walk outside, you know, I'm still with a, you know, Glock, a, a 45 in my hand and, you know, all the, the cop cars just pull up and, of course, they see a guy, gun in his hand. I mean, I had AR-15s, I had everything on me. You know, loudspeaker, drop your weapon, you know, drop your weapon and, you know, I, I can't hear, you know, I, I don't know. I'm just still walking and, you know, they keep telling me, my wife's trying to tell the cops, like, you know, no, he's one of the victims, the shooter's inside, you know? And I was probably about to get shot again. And of course, you know, had to listen to the wife. And when she told me, you know, drop your gun, I'm like, okay. So I just went ahead and threw it in the rocks and, you know, that was it. Bled out a little bit right there on the curb. I got to FaceTime my brother, but two cops, Two cops took me to the, to the ER and I was there for four or five days after some surgeries and everything. Uh, you know, I made it out, got to see my family again. And, you know, I pushed to, you know, get out of the hospital. I wanted to walk again. I wanted to do everything. So as soon as I woke up after surgery, first thing I said, I want to get off this bed. You know, I told them I want to walk. I want to do this. And... They called the nurse and within a few hours of waking up from surgery, I'm walking the hospital. I'm trying to run through that hospital. And they're like, nah, you gotta take it slow. But at that rate, yeah, this happened on a Sunday. I got out of the hospital on Friday morning. Uh, just to, you know, just to show just after that, you know, recovery. Didn't know like, what was gonna happen, you know? We just went through this traumatic event and everything, you know, processing everything was just so difficult. But I had to be strong, you know? I had to be strong for the family, for, you know, the wife. Although, you know, they saw it like, they need to take care of me. Like, no, I need to get well. Like, I need to get off this darn bed. You know, I need to start doing things. I need to start moving. I need to talk. I need to, you know, to the family. I need to be strong, you know? Cause I got these two little girls at the time, what, 11 year old and a nine year old or whatever age they were, but about 13 and 11 at that time. Now they're 15 and uh, 13, but you know, I have to be strong. Uh, with time, you know, I just stayed quiet about this story, but then something hit that, you know, you don't really hear stories about the good guy with the gun. You always just hear, how bad guns are, you, you, you know, my story never made it mainstream. The reason why, you know, a gun owner's radio even heard my story was because, you know, NRA, we reached out to the NRA and I started working with them to publish, you know, some videos and that's how it got traction. You know, that's the only reason. And then Tucker Carlson reached out and, you know, I did a segment with him, but if it wasn't for that, like my story would have just been buried under the rug and that's literally what's happening. Cause honestly, how many of you have actually heard of my story? Okay, we got two, but you know, you got others that, you know, haven't maybe, you know, I did talk yesterday. So I don't know if word got around, but you know, yesterday I asked the same question and only like two people that, are, you know, that I knew raised their hand. Everybody else had not heard my story. Why? Because, you know, at first, the story came out, mass shooting, several dead, and then the media started, you know, like, okay, let's pick up the story. But then, you know, the PD released a, a, a new, you know, new story on, you know, what happened. And when the PD said, oh, well, there was a victim, good guy with the gun took out the shooter. That's when the media said, you know what, we want no part of this story. You know, so at that point, my story was literally buried. But, I mean, a guy coming in and just shooting everybody, you know, possibly three dead, one survived, takes out the shooter, you know, five other wounded. That's a huge story. You know, that's a huge, that's like a, a movie type thing, you know, something you hear in the movies. But of course, that story went, you know, unheard. You know, and so I, I took it upon myself, that responsibility that, you know, God gave me an opportunity to be here. I cannot just waste it. I need to let everybody know of the importance of our Second Amendment. Let everybody know why I carry 
and how carrying my tool paid off. You know, it paid off by saving my life, you know, friends and, you know, my family's life. So I'm trying, you know, I, I'm that living proof. So I feel my responsibility to let everybody know that no, you know, it's not, we don't have a, you know, gun problem. We don't need more gun control. You know, it's a mental health problem that we have. You know, that's definitely what it is because, you know, you cannot blame the tool. It's like anything, like, <clears throat> it's like a car. Uh, anybody can just, you know, jump in a car and, you know, you hear stories, this guy wanted to commit suicide, so he jumped in his car and he just road rage and starts crashing into people and, you know, a family of, of three dead because this guy just, like, hit him head on. What is it now? Hate the car? Let's ban cars? No, you can't blame the car. You blame the person behind the wheel. You know, sometimes accidents do happen and that's, you know, unavoidable. You know, that's why it's called an accident. But, you know, active shooting and stuff like that, they're not accidents. You can't blame the tool, you blame the person. And that's the problem we have today. And again, you don't hear the countless stories of, you know, how firearms stop the threat or saved lives or nothing like that. Like uh, with the NRA, when I was uh, doing a story, how was it they mentioned that, you know, you, you hear mass shootings and stuff like that in the media and articles, I forgot how many, so many times. But then when you hear like, the, you know, the word like, you know, save lives or good guy with a gun or something like that, like you, you barely even hear that. You know, it's not part of the agenda. They just want to make the firearm look bad. You know, so, like I said, I am that living proof. I carry for one reason, self-defense. You know, I became a father at a young age. You know, I'm, I'm a Cali boy. I grew up here in Southern California, you know, born and raised and a little too expensive. I think I was like 19 when I had my daughter and got married. I was about 19. And, you know, I had a choice to make, you know, go, go live with my parents, live with her parents or whatever, or, you know, get out of California. You know, went to Arizona and Arizona was different. Like it was a whole different experience. I'm walking into the bank, I'm walking into a grocery store and you see this guy just, you know, with a firearm right here. You see guys in a Harley with a sling and a shotgun. And I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> like, this is, this is wild, man, this is wild. But at that point, by the time I turned 21, I bought my first pistol and I carried that thing religiously. I just carried it everywhere and, you know, it's not that we live life scared. You know, it's not, we, we shouldn't live, you know, our life scared or anything like that, but we should be prepared. Should be prepared for the worst because it can happen. You know, you, we always say, we see things and it's always like, it's not going to happen to me. You know, it's never going to happen to me. Oh, that's movie stuff. Like, no. Well, that it's never gonna happen to me, that situation actually happened to me. And if I wasn't prepared, or if I wasn't caring, I mean, I wouldn't be here before you guys, you know, speaking on this situation. Uh, my wife, most likely my kids, I would have never met my unborn child, you know, now I have a beautiful little two year old, she's about to be two, you know, I got to meet her. She got to grow up with a father because I was, you know, caring. So I'm just, you know, I just want this story to be heard and for the actual reason, just to let people know that there is true evil out there. I mean, there's just so much evil. I mean, we see it everywhere. You know, a lot of times we try to turn that blind eye or try not to see it and just, you know, live our normal lives. But sometimes, you know, that evil is going to catch up and, you know, you never know when. It's right there. It's, you know, right at your doorstep. And what are we going to do about it? Like in my story, law enforcement showed up after. If he would have showed up, you know, they're not there ready to protect you. They'll show up at the aftermath. So it's up to who? It's up to us. It's up to you. You know, it's like, if I learned one thing, it's like, 
train and carry. And I, I'm in my living room watching TV with, you know, a holstered gun. And I'm just sitting there and it's just, I'm prepared for the worst, man. Somebody kicks down my door. I don't need to go run to a gun safe. I don't need to go run to something. I have it right here. Like, who's banging on my door? I'm ready to go. You know, it's, you know, just being prepared. You know, I, I feel times are getting worse and every day is just getting worse. And again, not saying live in fear, but just be prepared. You know, it, if my story can inspire somebody to be prepared and, you know, maybe a situation happens to them where, you know, they're able to defend themselves and I feel like my story itself or what I'm doing now, just speaking or, you know, making videos and just, you know, spreading awareness. And I, I feel like it was worth it. You know, if it just saves, you know, one person. And so again, you know, I, somebody had, somebody had told me, don't you hate guns because you got shot by one? Like, no, it also saved me. I don't hate the tool. You know, so, you know, in this world we live in, just, you know, we got to be prepared at all times, definitely. You know, and it's up to us to defend ourselves and our family. And I, I know I probably said this right now, I keep repeating myself, but just that's how important I think it is. You know, it's kind of like <clears throat> it's that muscle memory. You just got to engrave it, engrave it in your head, the importance, the importance, just carry, carry, carry. <clears throat> You know, it d doesn't make you like a gun nut or a bad person. Because I get that, like, oh, he's a gun nut. How many guns do you have? Are you always carrying around, you damn gun nuts? And like, no. Like, what are you scared of? You know, I was like, not a damn thing. You know, I'm, I'm not scared, you know. But, you know, becoming a young father and seeing this, you know, sweet little innocent face, my responsibility to, you know, take care of it, best believe I'm going to, you know, I'm gonna lay some bullets down first and ask questions later just to defend those, that little girl. And now, you know, three little girls. So, you know, that's my story and, you know, why I'm spreading awareness and letting everybody know, you know, my story. And I hope, you know, my story, you know, touched your guys' heart in some way or taught a lesson in some way. And, you know, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, for sure. She... Oh, just so you know, this doesn't amplify your voice, it just records. It's just on the recording. Yeah. So I think you forgot to tell people that you, you're an instructor, right? Yes. She, okay, you're an instructor, <laughs> and I want to thank you for everything that you've do, you're doing, because I heard your story shortly after it happened, and I saw it on Colian Noir's okay. podcast, and uh, you're just, I just can't believe that you're still standing here in front of all of us for what, ha what happened to you. It's just incredible. And I think that a, a, a big part of all these mass shootings are all the young, young kids who did not have good parents to raise them and, and teach them right from wrong. I agree. And just like the guy, that, the guy that took out, tried to take out Trump, you know? I mean, that kid, you know, his, his family didn't, didn't uh, teach him right from wrong. And then just the other day, the, the school shooter, I mean, the father, they arrested the father because he bought his 14 year old, well, when he was 13, he got that gun from his father. Right. And then the mother had an incredibly long criminal record. I, I saw her mugshot on, on, on the internet. And you know, when you got two parents like that who don't really care about their kids, what what the and they, they obviously don't spend time with your with their kids. And if you spend time with their, with your kids and you teach them right from wrong, they're not going to do that kind of stuff. My wife and I raised two beautiful, incredible boys. They just turned 20, 28 and twenty six. Oh, awesome. And um, my older son is uh, works for the Maricopa County Sheriff's Department. And my younger son just got his concealed carry permit a couple months ago, and I'm waiting for mine any day it's coming. And I just, I highly recommend that people do what you say and buy a gun and train 
because just because you have a gun in your home doesn't mean that you're going to survive something like you did. Right. You have to train. You have to learn how to use that gun because you know, a lot of people just buy guns and they say, oh, yeah, okay, I got a gun in my I home. Got a gun. And now, now I'm protected. Well, you're not protected. No. Because when you have three or four guys kicking down your door and they want to do a home invasion, you got to know how to use that gun. And not only that, but I understand you taught your family and your children how to yes. use guns too. So not only if you're not home and they're home and that happens, they can defend themselves as well. So people should not be afraid of guns. And if you're afraid of guns, go get the training. Get the training that you need to, to get over that fear because that's what's going to save your life. Definitely. So. Anyway, yeah. Congratulations. Oh, to you. thank you. So yeah, so after everything I did, uh, I got I got certified and became an instructor. I've done a few private lessons, but I mainly did it to, you know, show my friends and family, you know, have the knowledge so I can teach my kids. And yes, I did buy my my little girls their first uh, pistol. So I take them out, and this is like their gun. I hold on to it; it's in my safe. But we got shooting, this is yours. And I teach them with it. So it's a little 22 full-size pistol. And I mean, they love it. My older daughter, my 15-year-old, she's such a great shot. I mean, she's better than me. <laughs> I, I don't know, just right away, the first time shooting, I mean, she was right on that bullseye. And it's, it's incredible, you know? Way to make daddy proud, you know? She had, she had a good teacher. <laughs> Thank you. So going on to the kids thing, so, and he kind of touched on it a little bit, and I was going to ask, um, prior to your incident, how involved were your, your kids in, in firearms? And then obviously afterwards, there are a lot more. Can you explain that process from before your incident to now what they do and, and how yeah, comfortable they sure. are and things like that? So be before, they knew what a firearm was. They shot with like a BB gun, something like that. So they kind of knew, but nothing. They, they just knew like the, the don't touch it, this, if you see it, they know daddy carries, you know, everywhere. They know wherever we're at, daddy has a gun on him. You know, they, they knew all that. They know what it does. But after the situation, they actually experienced firsthand what they can do, how destructive they are, you know, on the wrong, in the wrong hands. And so now it's kind of like, they see how, what that gun did and what daddy's gun did and why they're here now and why daddy's still here because of his gun. So they've learned to like, hey, you know, we need them. We need them in the house. They're thankful that I have one. And it was kind of like, you got to learn. So now it's a little different. Now it's like, okay. This is how, you, now it's like full on training because they didn't have that before, but this is how you load a mag. This is how you do this. This is what this is. What is this? Okay, trigger. What does it do? Okay, you know, so now it's a little more involved. Now they know like the mechanical and how a firearm works. And now they can actually, I can hand them a firearm, you know, unchambered with a box of ammo and they'll be able to load it, you know, fill up the mag, go rack one up and they'll be able to shoot, so difference now they're so, trained so seeing that now obviously you, you think it's hey it's a great idea now to train your kids yes they should something may happen to me and i may be put down but you know exactly where this firearm is and you need to go use it right you know not so, that you ever really want to but right you need to have that knowledge now it's like i should have done this a long time ago and I know even stay with my wife because, I mean, I'm not saying that it would have happened or what, but I mean, she knew that I carried. If she was well trained and saw me hit the ground, she could have just reached in and grabbed my Glock and just, you know, as that guy's walking towards the door, gone behind him and just put him down. And she would have been the hero. You know, that would have been like the most awesome story ever. You know, husband gets shot, she goes, reaches in, grabs his gun and goes behind the shooter and takes him out. Like, oh my God, that would have been awesome. You know, but she wasn't well trained and, you know, that's it. And honestly, at the end of the day, I'm the one to blame for of why she's not trained. So you said um, yesterday that you didn't have extensive gun training, but now you do. So it, uh, what you did was effective. So um, 
how do you uh just to add on to everything said today obviously gun training is important but you didn't have extensive gun training at that time right right so at, at that point it's uh i've been involved with firearms since i was like six years old uh at six i shot my first ak with my dad and you know he taught me you know the basics gun safety and stuff like that so that was my training and then eventually when i turned 18 i bought my first shotgun and I guess at that point, YouTube was like my training, you know? Never had really formal training, but it was just repetition. If I was always carrying, by the time I was, you know, I was 21, I was always carrying, and at that time I was 34. So you can see all that time of just constantly just carrying and carrying and knowing that I had one in the chamber and it's, you know, right here. And so it becomes this muscle memory. Uh, and honestly, it's like when, it, when that's, you know, you're in a life or death situation, like, like 80, 90% of like your thinking skills and everything just kind of goes out the window. So you're literally just relying on muscle memory. So if you carry, don't carry, or sometimes you have one in the chamber or you don't, then that muscle memory, you're not really building it. And when all that, those, everything you're thinking, critical thinking, everything goes out the window, you're not sure if you have one in the chamber or not. You're not sure if you have your gun and your, whole, your waist or not. You know, you, you don't know if the gun is actually in your purse or not. You know, you, you got to build that repetition so that that muscle memory just gets engraved. And like me, like when I woke up, I knew 100% that I had my firearm here and I knew 100% that there was one in the chamber. So I knew without a doubt in my mind with that muscle memory that this is all I had to do. So just building that and just knowing everything so just going out to the desert and shooting with no actual formal training you know i'm not law enforcement um not military i'm just an average you know dad just trying to make it here in america and you know just raise you know good kids and that's it that's who i am so i'm regular guy i'm nothing special but um that's how effective this tool was you know so that's why you know, I spread this, this story. I mean, if I was this like Navy SEAL, you know, retired or whatever, you know, and I'm carrying and I took out the bad guy and I'm trying to tell this story, then I'm like, come on, you're a damn Navy, you know, you're something, you're military or something. But without that background, I think that's what makes this story a little more powerful. Because if I was able to do it, it effectively, that's how effective this tool was. And I mean, a anybody can do it. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much for your story. This is so good to, see, to hear from you and see you. Oh, thank you. Um, did anybody else at the party besides your wife know that you carry? And should you make it kind of known? And then did any of, the, of your friends know you carry? And were they of sound mind? Obviously, they didn't go to you and try to no. take it off. No. So... It, everybody just scattered. It was just kind of, you know, something happens, you start hearing the rounds, everybody just went. It's not like they were looking for me. Yes, of course, my wife knew I was carrying. Uh, the host, homeowner, his wife, they knew I carry. Again, well, you know, that girl was fighting off the, the shooter when he broke into the master bedroom and he starts choking her out. You know, she's yelling my name because she knew I carry. She, she, that was her house. So she knew I carried and yeah, most of my friends, they know, you know, they carry here and there, not really religiously like me. I don't think anybody else was carrying. I think one person was, but I think he was the first, no, the second one that died. He was carrying from what I've heard. Not confirmed, really don't know if he was actually carrying. That's just what I heard. But the police report is literally this thick. I got a copy of it and I read it all, Just got a highlighter, sort of highlighting things. Oh, I didn't know, you know, just that, just, just went through it all and a lot of things were blanked out. I guess they weren't for my eyes, you know? They kind of put like a black line over everything they don't want me to read, but, but yeah, friends and family, uh, I would say spouse, kids, it's fine if they know that you carry at this point, like now, like the less people that know, the better. 
makes you less of a target. You know, active shooter or something, and they know you're carrying, you're gonna be the first one to go because you're the threat. You know, so I, yeah, like now I keep it to myself. But again, spreading awareness. You're gonna see me next time and be like, I know he's carrying. <laughs> you know, so that, that, that's the responsibility or that's the risk that I'm willing to take, you know, just for to teach people and tell people my story and hopefully, but everybody knows I carry. It's no secret. I tell my story and the importance, so, you know, there's no way I can keep it a secret, but yeah. Everybody else, I recommend just keeping it a secret. Makes you less of a target. Um, first of all, thank you for being here. And this was the first time I really heard your story, and I was here. I'm in the group. So. Um, but two things you said that was really important. Um, one of them is, is the whole thing about training, because a lot of your friends, even if they knew you were carrying, their mindset was, get the heck out of here. Right. Instead of, let's solve the problem. And um, so the likelihood that they would respond rationally rather than just to the lizard brain taking over and getting you out of the way was very low. But since you had practiced in a lot, you knew, knew what was going on. The other thing is I've been fighting, oh, I love Facebook, but anyway, fighting with the, who would buy their son a, an AR at 14? I said, well, I bought mine at 12, but I kept control of them. And trained with them and had them all up to speed. You shoot cowboy together. They had their own set of cowboy guns. They didn't have them in their bedroom, but they learned the responsibility. They learned, and the, and the cool thing about shooting things like cowboy, you 12 year old shows up on the, on the range, they're treated as an adult. Their responsibilities are the same, and that builds that responsibility level up. And I Definitely. appreciate the way that you've taken that responsibility to your kids and, and given them the tools to protect themselves. Thank yeah, you very definitely. much. Thank you. Um, once again, uh, thank you for sharing your story and being here. And I'm, I'm really happy that you get a second chance to continue that story. So yeah, that's great. Um, having said that, um, from the top of your head, um, do you feel like life has gotten back to normal or do you think life is a new normal? And with that, have thoughts um, come to your head as to whether in that new normal, if, if it is, um, would you do anything less of, anything more of, or anything new of from the top of your head? And thank you again. Yeah, for sure. Um, wow, honestly, uh, life is not normal. Life is not the same. Uh, I've opened up a new chapter in my life, you know, started this whole new journey. Uh, so life will never be the same. You know, we went through this horrific experience and it just changes you and it's gonna, you know, scars for life. Especially knowing that that situation, you know, you lost two good friends and you literally, you went to their funeral and just saw them there. People like, you know, that you were there with, now everybody's crying and mourning these, you know, these fathers, these husbands, literally with the first one to go had, you know, two little daughters, I think one was like six, five and like a two, three year old. And, you know, will they remember him? Probably not. They'll see pictures and all that, but they won't have that opportunity to grow up with the dad. So just thinking of all this and we were there together, like it, it changes you. Would I do something different? No. If, uh, if I can go back, I would still be there at that party. I, I think things happen the way it was supposed to happen. You know, I got shot and, and maybe that's the way it had to happen. I'm not saying that, you know, God made it happen, but it's just, you know, I feel like, yeah, he did save my life, but if I wasn't there, how many more people we had buried? Uh, I was gonna have to work that day and, you know, my wife and kids would have been there. You know, I wouldn't have been there. I would have got a call and been like, hey, get your butt home. Your wife and kids are dead or something, you know? So this sacrifice, I feel like, you know, it's justified for me. So just knowing that I, 
you know, protected my family and, and, and yeah, like, I, I'm proud of taking this guy down. You know, this guy was just complete evil. And that's what gives me peace of mind to sleep at night, just knowing that I put him down. You know, it doesn't make me a murderer or anything, but I defended my family. You know, if a life had to be taken to preserve, you know, my family, my unborn child, I'll take another one any day of the week. And that's what gives me peace of mind. And yeah, I sleep like a baby now. <laughs> Raul, uh, I just have a couple more things I'd like to, yeah. to ask. Um, so you said that the, the, the host or the lady who owned the home, she's the one that ran upstairs to protect the kids in the bedroom, correct? That was my wife. My, oh, was well, my wife ran to, it was a single story, but she ran to a bedroom, barricaded the door while she was seven months pregnant, moving a big dresser and threw the kids in the closet. Okay, but who was the lady who was yelling your name? Oh, that was the host. Okay, did she know at that time that she was yelling your name that you were, you had been she shot? She didn't know that I was literally most likely dead and shot. She didn't know. But, but did she know that you had gotten shot? No. Oh, okay. She, yeah, she, no, she, did, she didn't know. Everybody she, scattered. Yeah, and, she, well, she had gone into her master bedroom to change her son's, you know, diaper oh, oh, or change them or something. So she was in there. Oh, okay. And then her sister-in-law went in there as well. And then, so she was there with her sister-in-law and two boys. And I don't know, I think that other girl, there was, because there was three girls. She had gone in there too to use the restroom. And then everything happened. So it was kind of like, what the heck is going on? And yeah. close the door, lock it, go hide. So the last thing I want to talk to you about really quick is that your situation um, was a bittersweet situation with the people who were at the party because they could just, I can just imagine what they were thinking. Even though this man was crazy, guns are evil. They probably that mindset, they had that mindset that, oh yeah, if he didn't have a gun, it wouldn't happen. Right. But then at the same time, they saw that you took this guy out. And if you didn't have that gun, a lot more people would have been killed. Did any of your friends, after everything blew over, did any of the people that were at the party talk to you about anything like that? It's like, I'm so happy that uh, you had the gun, but at the same time, I, don't, I really don't like guns and I'll never have guns. No, it never really talked about like not liking guns or anything like that. I mean, I know like at the funeral, a lot of people are coming up to me and like even, you know, the deceased family that I've never met. Like, so you're the guy that, you know, like, thank you. Everybody giving me hugs and stuff like that. And, you know, grateful for that. And, but, you know, unfortunately, you know, guns are not for everybody and me speaking my story because me standing up and, you know, telling my story, you know, I lost a lot of friends or most people at that party. They wanted to move on from this chapter. I felt the importance of telling the story and because I continued to tell the story and started making videos with the, you know, NRA and, you know, posting on social media, like they just kind of pushed me aside. So it's unfortunate to say that all of my friends that were there that survived that shooting, I no longer speak to because me speaking up and defending our second amendment. But of course, it's a sacrifice I'm you know, willing to make. Well, thank you for letting me ask all these questions. Yeah, no, no, here. definitely, it's for sure. It's a pleasure to meet you too. <laughs> Likewise. All right, I think that's it, thank we have you. Time. Okay, thank you so much, Raul. That was a powerful <laughs> testimony. Thank you so much.